Jim, welcome, welcome to Jamestown, New York, the home of the Jamestown Tarp Skunks. I'd like to hear the story behind that. Yeah, so. yeah. So I'm reading this piece from Eric Brady. Oh yeah. June 21st, 2020, and it says, Roy Hobbs takes a mighty swing. His pennant winning home run explodes the stadium lights, and he rounds the bases in triumph. That's how the film version of The Natural ends, right? Well, yes, that's the climactic moment, but then comes a bit more. Remember? The home run ball floats across time, across the plains and prairies, until it smacks at last into the glove of Hobbs' son, Ted, who softly tosses the baseball back to his father. They are playing catch with golden smiles in a field of golden wheat. The movie trades broadly on the Arthurian myth, but it ends with this gossamer vision of the distinctly American myth of fathers playing catch with sons, all of which makes it for a fitting tableau for Jim Overfield on this Father's Day. With that set up, talk about the relationship with you, your dad, Joe Overfield, which ultimately led to your project today. Okay, I'd be glad to. Uh, well, when my dad, when I was born, uh, back on November 13th, 1942, uh, I was alive for maybe six months. My dad left and went off to fight in World War II. Uh, luckily, he didn't do much fighting. He ended up being stationed in India. But I didn't see him for a couple of years. And uh, when he came back, I'm sure he had the dream that many fathers have of raising a son who would somehow make it to the majors, uh, playing baseball in a game he loved ever since he was a young child. Uh, and I was pretty good for my size, but the key phrase there is for my size. <laughs> I think when I was a uh, sophomore in high school, I went out for the wrestling team and the coach wanted me to lose two pounds so I could wrestle at 98. <laughs> and I went home and looked in the mirror, saw my ribs sticking out, I said, I don't think I want to be a wrestler. But I was really too small to be a really good baseball player. I think they, uh, I played a couple of years of JV ball, but never, never did much. But uh, as far as baseball is concerned, I learned to love the game, probably not as much as my dad did. But certainly, it's been a very important you know, part of my life. Um, I uh, have a son who is never much interested in the game, uh, which is OK. But uh, I maintain my interest just by following baseball on a day-to-day -day basis while living in Burlington, Vermont, which is where I ended up uh, having my career. And then for many years, was an umpire, which I really on most days enjoyed. <laughs> there were days when it wasn't very enjoyable, but I got to be a uh, pretty good ump, worked a lot of high school college games in and around Burlington. And all this, uh, while this was all going on, my dad was slowly and gradually uh, building a reputation among baseball historians as one of the really good amateur baseball historians in the country. He began publishing articles on the Bisons, uh, oh, back in the 1950s when he was around 40 years old, um, began to publish other articles in the local Buffalo papers. And, uh, but the high point of his, his life in terms of his most important accomplishment in his eyes and in the eyes of uh, the rest of us is his 100 seasons in Buffalo baseball which he finished in uh, 1985. And uh, it was a very uh, successful book, sold out through several printings, gained national attention. And uh, his, his standing, as I said, among amateur baseball historians is, was really made rock solid by that, by that achievement. Well, you're on achievements. One of the things that he is very proud of was taking one of the Buffalo Bison's players prior to the turn of the century into the mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. 
Right. Uh, Jim Galvin, who was a uh, pitcher for the National League Bisons uh, between 1880 and 1885. Uh, I'd have to go back and look up in the book. <laughs> but he, uh, he was kind of a one-man show. Back then, uh, most teams carried two pitchers, and one pitcher basically did all the pitching. Uh, it was at a time when pitchers literally pitched the ball like today we pitch horseshoes. It was an underhanded motion. So Jim Galvin, um, yeah, he won hundreds and hundreds of games. He would pitch 75 or 80 games a year and was recognized at the time uh, for what he was, uh, one of the National League's uh, great pitchers. But then, uh, for some reason, which I've never quite understood, um, he kind of disappears. People, he, he got dropped by the Bisons, uh, got picked up by the Pittsburgh Alleghenies, and that's where he finished his career. But uh, when the National Hall of Fame got started in the 1930s, uh, he'd been pretty much forgotten. And so, my dad, uh, gave himself the task of uh, beating the drums for Jim Galvin. And uh, it was a, a drum that was pretty easy, easy to learn how to play because if, if you look at his record, it's uh, pretty spectacular. And uh, although he gets a lot of credit for uh, um, getting Galvin in the hall, he also did much the same thing for a couple of other uh, former Bison old timers, uh, Jim Deacon White, mm -hmm. who was uh, born and brought up in a little little town just outside of Corning, uh, was another old timer uh, who, time after time, never garnered enough votes to get into the hall. Um, sadly, he uh, finally did, but a couple of years after he passed away. Now my dad wrote a, one of the earliest things he did was an article uh, which I think was entitled Six Old Timers that Belong in the Hall of Fame. And uh, Deacon White was the last one to, uh, to make it. But uh, yeah, Galvin, the Galvin story is a, is a fairly, it's a nice heartwarming story. We only won 365 games. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, yeah just a, <laughs> Uh, so at some point, Jim, you're in Burlington, Vermont. I am. You are a history guy, graduate from Princeton. You <laughs> certainly keep in touch with your dad. Your dad passes away shortly after the book. Or, well, there was a, 15 years. 15 years. Okay. But what said, hey, I should probably pick up this book. It ended in 1984 mm -hmm. and see what I can do to bring it current. I mean, at some point, yeah. there's, an, there's an aha moment. Well, it, my, my, my dad was asked, asked that question many times after the book came out. When are you going to do an update? And he kept saying, oh yeah, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, but he never did. One of the reasons was that Mike Bellani here hired him to write a regular column for the Bisongram and uh, <laughs> big long articles on new areas that he was researching. And, uh, you know, he was busy, he still was retired, but managed to go into the office uh, every morning uh, to work a half a day. And so he never uh, never got to the book. And uh, when he died in the year 2000, uh, it wasn't too long after that. Uh, once every couple of years, someone would contact me from the Buffalo area and said, hey, I, I want to do an update of the book. And they'd say, you know, we've got this plan for it. And I said, that's fine, I'm busy. I, teaching at the University of Vermont, and I can't, well, here I am in Burlington. So uh, nothing came of it. But then, uh, about three years ago, uh, things changed a little bit. And um, I don't know how many of you remember a columnist for the old Courier Express, Phil Ranallo. He was a great, great guy, great sports writer. And his son published, uh, came out with a book that uh, was an anthology of some of his most famous columns. 
And I thought, that, what a great idea. I'm going to do the same thing with all the articles that my dad did at the Bison publication that the Bisons were putting out then. And that would be something I could do from Burlington. It wouldn't be much of a problem. But, uh, yeah, then I began talking to a couple Buffalo people, and uh, they said, well, why don't you do something more ambitious? We're going to take his 1985 book and you know, update it, and then you can put the you know the Bison Graham articles by your dad at the end of it. And so I said, oh, yeah, it's, it, sounds, it sounds doable. And then I called Mike, and of course he had all kinds of other ideas for the book, and one thing led to another. And um, the result is this big, gigantic, 400-page book that I never envisioned at the beginning. And of course, the other thing that's happened that made it possible for me to do this is the, uh, the internet revolution, where it's now possible to do serious baseball research in Burlington, Vermont, about Buffalo in the 1880s, because uh, all the major Buffalo newspapers are easily accessible. You can type in a player's name in a year, and newspapers.com will bring you to the 17 <laughs> newspaper articles where the guy's name was mentioned. And uh, a lot of records readily available. And so with the help of a number of uh, accessories in Buffalo who have written articles for the book, uh, Mike Harrington in the news has done one. Uh, he's doing another one on the incredible 20, 2020 events. You know, it's been entailed there. Uh, Sal Mayorano, Mayorano of the Democratic Chronicle has done one. Mike has done several, including a great piece on the uh, building of Pilot Field, another one on the making of the natural. And so, uh, you know, I'm the, I'm the editor, I guess my name will go at the top of the, uh, the book under the title, but it's been a collaborative effort. My dad, dad's material is part of it, a lot of it is material I wrote, and it has stuff by other helpers too. And uh, here we are. What I found interesting is Yuri Brady's article was terrific, because yeah, it set Eric, that scene great. so well that at the end the father and the mm -hmm. son are throwing and it turns out the son is Bob Rich's Jr.'s son. Yeah. Maybe. Well, my dad and I spent many hours playing catch. Yeah. Or playing pepper, you know. Those are the great and, and that's how they conclude that article. Yeah. Okay, with that image of the two of you playing catch and this sort of being the book, which is symbolic of that catch. Yeah. No, it is. And the connection between father and son um, gets even more interesting when you look at the press conference we're having tomorrow at the Johnny B. Wiley Amateur Athletic Sports Pavilion that is a former War Memorial Stadium that was built as a WPA project in 1937 and first known as you know Rush Stadium after the former mayor. Um, back in 1985 that would have been Bob Rich's third year um, with the Bisons, and in 1983, when he uh, saved professional baseball in Buffalo and purchased a team, he basically set three goals, and they're in the book under um, him as an owner. And it was to get us from Double A, where we we're a member of the Eastern League, to Triple A, where Buffalo was for many, many years, as quickly as we can to work with Mayor Jimmy Griffin on getting a downtown stadium built, and number three, doing everything we can to bring Major League Baseball to Buffalo. Um, the After the 84 season, we're looking at things, and I said, do you realize that next year is the 100th season of Buffalo baseball? And at this time, Mindy is now in the picture, and we collaborated, and Bob, who is a huge history fan, said, we cannot lose sight of that history. Let's do something. Okay. So my go-to guy has always been Vince McNamara. And now Joe and uh, Cy and all them had always been around the park. But we sat with Vince and we began with doing a uh, Hall of Fame committee. 
And Cy, uh, by the way, is Cy Williams. Cy Williams, legendary. Well, no, yeah, Cy Williams, legendary scout. But Vince McNamara put together this Hall of Fame committee. We got them all nice blazers. And that original committee, you know, my major regret is that I wasn't like Greg and tape recorded all those meetings because the arguing over getting a player in or not in to that Hall of Fame was just extraordinary. So the second person we got a hold of was, uh, you know, Joe Overfield. And I said, Joe, do you realize that next year is, you know, the 100th season of Buffalo baseball? I mean, what a stupid lead-in to a historian. <laughs> and his answer was, you know, in a humble sort of way of, absolutely. So, well, we've got to do something. And he said, well, I've always, you know, I, I can put together, I think we'll work on a book. And I've never seen, literally, I've watched him put this together at a typewriter in his home office, and his... You know, Jim's mom and Joe's uh, wife was, um, how long was she in the Macaulay uh, nursing home? Oh, she probably went in 1980. Yeah. With? MS, yeah. Joe would go to the nursing home every day? Yeah, every, every evening. Every evening for dinner with his wife, and then he would leave and go to the ballpark, or in the off-season go home and work on this. And I go way back with him to when I was a cub reporter for the Tonawana News and any type of baseball story, you call Joe. And he all, well, give me a minute. And he would look and call you back. And, you know, he was, back then, he was the, the Google of anything he needed baseball. And he had it. And I would just love going over there, especially then when I got involved with the Bisons. <clears throat> and the team would be on the road. I would, you know, was um, we grew up in Kemo, we weren't too far from him. But to go and watch him doing either writing a, a Bisongram article or he had to write an article for Sabre and he's doing research. And he has one radio here on the Bi Bison game with Pete Weber and another radio over here with this game. And mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was incredible. It was just a real honor. So in 1985, he came out with his book. We're now, goal number one is achieved. We, we're now a member of AAA, the American Association. So we had a night to honor Joe and the book, and he threw out the first pitch at War Memorial Stadium. Well, this book has been three years in the making, and it is, that's a long time. And Jim is absolutely right. Him, Brian Frank, the other assistant editor, they're educators. So they went over and every comma, if a comma, the, we're, we're about ready to set the record with, uh, with our designer because normally you send them a Word document and they'll typeset it and send it back and you might have a couple edits here and there. Um, we've had a few to the point that we're almost setting a record. But it's good because it'll have factually and grammar, grammar is it'll be solid. So we were all set um, to release it a couple of years ago, but then we, it didn't work. Well, this was the sixth and absolutely final release was Father's Day weekend 2020. Jim would be able to come up, have a family reunion. It was perfect. The Bisons were home on a Tuesday, Wednesday night. We were going to the History Museum to do a little, bring people in the book, out on the stage, everything was set, it was perfect. Well, COVID, pandemic hits in March, and we're watching, and April comes, and we don't know who's gonna play, what's gonna play. Well, we certainly threw the June date out, and said, look, we just have to release it. So we said, let's go the end of October, and we'll be ready for the holidays. And we knew we'd be buried by football and no big fanfare. And, you know, we didn't even know if we could do an event at the History Museum, but we were set to release the book. Well, then the Bison season ends, canceled. So now the 2020 season, and in part one, every season from 1857 to 2020 is included.
So now Jim has to write for the first time in that history. We are now making history by the delay of our book because no other season has ever been canceled. So now he wants to tie in the Spanish flu from the early 1900s to this pandemic. And so now that we figure it's a, that's it, that's the final chapter in this book. Oh, and then the Blue Jays want to, now Major League Baseball is going to play, and the Blue Jays want to have their uh, taxi squad playing in Buffalo. Great. We'll add a sentence or two about that. So now we're rolling along, and all of a sudden we hear they can't play in Canada. And I'm like, wow, this could happen here. So we were all excited. We called the uh, owner of your former um, landlord at uh, One Seneca Tower and said, hey, if they come here, could we rent out all the suites and all the offices that overlook the ballpark, <laughs> we'll turn them into suites because we did that at, for our, a lawyer at Phillips Lytle and someone at Marine Midland back in 88. And he said, great idea, I love baseball. Well, unfortunately, his, um, uh, his construction manager said, no, we can't afford having all these people in there. So then we tried to do the parking ramp to watch the games. It wouldn't do that. So there's nowhere you could see the games. So we said, well, if they're really going to play here, and you know all of what went on to get them here, well, they finally got here. So now we're going to include that in the book. So now the book is more of a timely history piece by having that. So tomorrow we're going to announce this book will officially be, we really should do it this way, because we're going to unveil the cover <laughs> tomorrow morning at 11 a.m., and I'll get your cards and we'll send it to you. Um, we're also going to, and we're going to do it at home plate at the Johnny B. Wiley Amateur Sports Pavilion at Jefferson and Best, the former home of the Bisons at Warmore. Now, what makes that significant is that in 85, his dad threw out the first pitch for this book. 35 years later, Jim will be there announcing the cover, when this will be released during the World Series in October, and what. And then, you know, the price will have a pre-sale, and it's all included in here. But I think what I'm most excited about is Jim and I, from the very beginning, wanted to do some type of donation with the proceeds of the book. Um, going to um, something where we could keep his dad's name on forever. And we were going back and forth, and then during the racial turmoil, I saw an interview with someone talking about, you know, these inner city youth need mentoring. They need a vision. They need goals. And it struck me that a good friend of mine runs a mentoring program inside the Johnny B. Wiley complex. And we have been in discussions, and tomorrow we're going to be announcing the uh, creation of the soon-to-be, you know, work out all the details of the uh, Joseph M. Overfield um, Memorial Baseball, Softball, and Mentoring Program. And that's what we're very excited about. Perfect. And then we'll sell sponsorship or supporter, corporate supporters of the book to help us with it. And uh, we're excited. He said we should interview everyone that was in the book. So uh, that's, you know, still around all that. So we began that last night at John Boutet's Sports Museum on Grand Island, and you've got to come over there and see it. Mm -hmm. But one of the in individuals that we interviewed was Conehead, oh. the famous <laughs> Conehead, with his hat and his jersey. And also, to honor it, we had a toast last night <laughs> with the official Conehead beer. So, Greg, we would like to present you with the uh, two, the final two cans of our group. Oh, look at this. But Conehead oh, only, was, only Mike Bellani would come up with a Conehead <laughs> But Conehead was the ultimate salesman. When I told him I went to Resurgence to buy that beer, said, you know, you could have gone to Wegmans this week and it's on sale. Yes. <laughs> What's the, uh, some of those tidbits that you uh, wrote up? Um, what were some of those that were most memorable? Tidbits? Um, about the, the history of the bison. Oh, memorable moments? Memorable moments. Well, um, 
course, they played thousands and thousands of ball games, so there were a lot of exciting, exciting games, a couple of which you were directly involved in. Uh, the 18 inning playoff game against Nashville was played to determine the uh, Eastern Division champion 1990 season. Uh, 18 innings and the Bisons lost heart heartbreaking fashion. Mm -hmm. And then next year they played uh, Denver in the American Association Championship game and they went out to Denver uh, two games up. Yeah. It was the best out of five series. <laughs> he's grimacing as you're telling the and story. They, oh, it's a painful story, but an incredible story. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, so they go out to Denver, lose the first game, but they're still up 2-1. And uh, the next night, play the fourth game in the series. They go into the ninth inning, down nine, eight to nothing, and no hits. They haven't touched the uh, Denver pitcher for, for any hits. So I mean, it's, it looks hopeless. So they mount this rally. The uh, couple calls go their way. They score, run here, run there. Um, they're got the bases loaded, three runs behind. Mm -hmm. The guy, the batter, uh, smashes one in the left center field gap. Two Drug runners, edge. Two runners score. The third guy rounds third. Should have been able to score. Umpire, you're out. Calls him out. Uh, Let's say the reaction on the part of the Buffalo players, managers, and management was extreme. Mike was ban Mike, I know, was banished from attending next night's game. No, I was fined. Oh, they left to watch the game. Yeah, so it was. Uh, yeah, the other most memorable game took place in September 1933. It was in the midst of the uh, Great Depression in Buffalo, you know, 20% unemployment rate, and uh, 1933 was really a very rough year for the city and for the country. And that was the first year that the uh, International League decided to go with the uh, playoff system where the top four teams would qualify and uh, have a playoff and the winning team would be declared the league, league champion. Well, that was a year the Bison didn't even have a 500 record. They were, ended up two games under 500 and nosed out the fifth place team by like one one hundredth of a percentage point. <laughs> it was some crazy thing. But they, uh, they by some miracle, they, uh, they got in the playoffs. They beat Baltimore in the first round and then played a uh, Played Rochester in the second second round for the championship, and they won the first two games there. The third game was played in Buffalo on a Friday night, and the game created a, a police episode and near riot. So many people wanted to get to the game. They totally overwhelmed the ticket takers. They, they broke in. People who had tickets to the game couldn't get in. People climbed over the fence. One guy climbed over the fence, fell off, and broke his arm. Oh. So <laughs> an ambulance had to come in, pick him up, to add to the chaos. The police were called in to quiet things down. And finally, Frank Offerman, the owner of the team, uh, yelled out that he was going to allow the game to be broadcast. It said no, no radio. And uh, some people went home and listened to the game on the radio. But uh, yeah, it was a game that and a team that completely transfixed the city. And it kind of, it's a team that hadn't had any luck for a couple of years, came from nowhere, had this game against Rochester, which they won, by the way. And uh, yeah, there, there were, it, it was just a crazy thing. After the game was over and the Bisons won, the fans stayed around for her. Hour celebrating. I guess a lot of them had rented seat cushions uh, during the for, to sit on during the game, and they were having mock 
you know, cushion fights. It was, it was quite something. So we write about that in the book. It's the uh, night the depression stood still in, in Buffalo. It was fantastic. And the only sad thing about it was they, uh, they didn't go on and win the Junior World Series, which would have made it perfect. But I think, uh, I forget who they played, but they, they didn't win that one. You know, Ali Carnegie was one of the oh, icons yeah. up in your neck of the Yeah, he played in that game. Sure. Yeah. Uh, was a manager here in 1944. That's right. What? Yeah. We have pictures of him. We got on a guy. Hey, he he came back and played one more year with the Bison. Yes, he was 45. Yeah. And there was a strong, just a strong connection between Jamestown because of the Tigers and, and, and Detroit itself. Mm -hmm. Did your paths cross with an Ollie Carnegie at that? Did you ever meet him? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm old, but not that old. Luke Easter? <laughs> Luke Easter? Did, did, did about Luke? Did I watched him play. Yeah. I watched Luke play, but yeah, uh, yeah I was. Uh, I was only three when Ali played his last. Jim, uh, he's uh, Ali is in our list of uh, amazing things about Buffalo baseball. Can you list why he's in there? Well, I mean, he holds all kinds of records: most games played, most home runs, most most hits, most doubles, and uh, he's an incredible, uh, incredible hit hitter who didn't really start playing serious professionally until he was in his. He was 31 years old. He was more than happy to uh, work, uh, work, quote unquote, in a variety of jobs in Pittsburgh, which basically meant he worked as a baseball player for the teams that were sponsored by Pittsburgh businesses. But then when the Depression hit, a lot of the businesses that sponsored semi-pro teams had to withdraw their sponsorship. So he played with Hazleton, which I think was in the New York Penn League. And uh, then the Bisons bought him and began his career. So he's the, uh, yeah, he's the all-time great Buffalo, Buffalo player. Um, he, the three numbers that are um, retired, um, Ali Carnegie, Luke Easter, and Jeff Manto. Um, probably will stay that way. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Um, Jim, I read here in this uh, in your press release here about you discovering uh, bison grams that were written by your dad. And baseball lends itself, as you, know, you guys made a lifetime's work of it, to creating memories probably greater than any sport. Any other sport. So yeah. Can you tell me or run me through how you felt when you? discovered these things? Did you know where they were and you were looking for them or you just randomly stumbled on them? And then maybe <laughs> some of the well, emotions might. that may have been elicited as a result of finding them and now, yeah. you know, years later you you have the finishing touches. Well, when my, when my dad passed away, he gave all of his baseball books and his papers mm -hmm. and photographs to the Buffalo uh, History Museum. And there were a few boxes that I don't know, they got left behind, and uh, my son's parents, who are Buffalonians, um, helped clean out his house, and all these couple boxes ended up in their barn in Williamsville. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they brought them to our home, I don't know, just four or five years ago, and I started looking through it. And I, as I think I mentioned earlier, I'd already looked at Paul Ranallo's book on, on, on his dad, Phil. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, I found all these rich articles full of interesting uh, perspectives and episodes and people uh, that he had written in the Weizenbaum. And I uh, tried to get, I, I had an incomplete run. There were several issues I was missing. It turned out that you know, none of the Buffalo libraries had a complete set. Hall of Fame had some of them. I was able to get finally all the articles. It turned out Mike has a <laughs> complete, complete set in his garage, but I didn't know it at the time. But I thought this would be a, you know, as I said, a, a great. I, I found them fascinating and so well done. I thought this would be a, a great way to you know, keep his name, keep his name going. What uh, is it? I can anticipate your answer, but what is the um, what is it about baseball oh, that boy. lends itself to a connection between father and son about history, 
stats. I mean, you know, you're. Yeah, it's, I've, I've thought of that question many times, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's frankly hard for me to pinpoint any one thing about the game. Um, I mean, it is, it has a longer historical pedigree than basketball, for example, which was invented by Mr. Naismith, I don't know, in the 1890s. Uh, football was kind of a college-only enterprise um, for most of its history. Uh, Buffalo actually had a, one of the early NFL teams. Um, but um, it was not followed as much as the college game. And, uh, you know, hockey tends to be uh, a more regional, regional thing. But I, uh, to be honest, I, I don't have a real good answer to that. I mean, it is a game that's um, amenable to statistical, endless statistical analysis, which has reached the point of almost <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> in today's, in to, where you can, you know, get statistics on which quadrant of the strike zone a batter is most likely to you know, get a hit and so forth and so on. But I think that's part of the uh, um, part of the attraction and interest. I mean, right from the very beginning, um, when Buffalo newspapers begin reporting on games played by the local amateur teams or the licensed uh, professional team, um, they all had box scores. They all had literally inning by inning summaries. I mean, they would spell out. Um, descriptions of exactly what had happened. Comment on the uh, calls made by the umpire and everything else. So there is this mound of statistics that you can um, that you can toy with, and if you're interested in tracing down who's holds the record for making the most errors in a single season and things like that, you can, you can follow it. Uh, I don't know about the whether it's uh, the season when baseball is played, beginning in the spring, and winter ending, you know, slowly evolving uh, through the fall. Uh, better than that, I it's, it's still somewhat of a mystery to me. What would your dad say about the project? Oh, I think he'd uh, he'd approve of it certainly. He and I, I mean, I read some drafts of the stuff he wrote for the original book, and uh, he often would help me with stuff I was writing. So uh, he would appreciate it, but I think he probably ribbed me a bit about how easy it's to do this research. <laughs> True. <laughs> because, uh, you know, the second, or the th last part of um, his book was uh, year by year, statistics of every Buffalo player all the way back to 1877, which is when they had their first professional team. And today you can go online and look it up on Baseball Reference and find all this information and more. It's there. Uh, when he compiled that information, and it's mind-boggling to think about how he did it, he was sitting in the reading room of the Buffalo History Museum, going through old brown Buffalo newspapers, looking at box scores, and uh, you know the, the number of hours that he spent doing that, I can't even imagine what it must be, but it's huge. And uh, he was never a big fan of new technology. He resisted automatic transitions of transmissions in cars. He didn't like ball, ballpoint pens. Um, he, I think by the time he, he was doing his work, the electric typewriter had been invented by IBM, but he wanted nothing to do with that. As Mike said, he was an old. Uh, and he loved it. Yeah, an old typewriter. 
or not. But uh, I think even he would have come around and taken advantage of some of the new opportunities. He had a good, good, good grandchildren who could show him how it, how it all worked. He <laughs> did. Uh, subject of baseball within Buffalo's African American community, and it has a history. It's just been unwritten, and I'm not sure we can ever we can ever get at it, just because the you know wasn't covered in the press. And, you know, there are a few records of any sort of left. Yeah. But when Babe Ruth uh, came to town a couple times to play exhibition games, uh, he played against an all-black Buffalo semi-pro team okay. called the Pittsburgh Colored Stars. For some reason, had relocated from Buffalo, That's very emotional. from Pittsburgh to Buffalo. Thank you. And he ran across um, a bunch of financial records yeah. relating to the 1878 Bison's team, and exactly you know what you know. There were contracts and lease arrangements and why they were there. I'm not sure, but he saw them, and he was already a big. Bison's fan, baseball fan, and he got interested in this team. And he began reading about it, and um, one lead led to another. Um, and that was really what set him <laughs> on his path of becoming a, a really serious amateur baseball historian. Well, doing that abstracting is a skill set requires great detail. Yes. And really, the records as they are now are just only recently been digitized. So I could see why your dad and his background, what he was used to, as he would be a little reluctant to change technologically <laughs> and the ability to just focus in on detail. I get it because yeah. I did some abstracting in my prior life, and I, and I love the frankly the conclusion of Eric Brady because he ties that all together. Mm -hmm. Where his last paragraph said. Researching land titles, oh. his history writ small. Mm -hmm. Telling the breadth of baseball in Buffalo, his history writ large. Joe Overfield did both. He gets the win, and now, all these years later, it's time to credit his son with the save. Yeah, well, that was very nice of Eric to say that. <laughs>